Hello, people. I want to thank you for coming to another episode of the Gonzo Archive. In these lectures, I'll be using my photography to share with you, to share with the public, my experiences in the communities that I love. And in tonight's lecture, I am going to introduce you to one of the most influential, the most important, and one of the most beloved figures in the New York City S&M kink and fetish community, the uh, meatpacking district in particular, and you're going to hear his story in his own words. Lenny Waller was a prominent member of New York City leather BDSM community. He was a loving, bearded, bisexual granddaddy of the leather fetish communities, and he was an institution in his own right. Lenny Waller was perhaps best known and beloved for his longtime management of the famous Hellfire Club in the old meatpacking district at 28 Ninth Avenue. It was originally located in an old, under-the-street Civil War vault under the worn cobblestones of 9th Avenue and 13th Street. In its early days, it featured all kinds of back rooms, cages, racks, glory holes for anonymous sex. He also operated the vault, the manhole, cell blocks 28, a bunch of other clubs and organizations. The Lenny I knew over the years was a generous guy. He was kind but firm. Uh, he spent his life working in underground kink cultures and he was capable of dealing with the politics of city regulations, and he was level-headed enough to make connections in the city bureaucracy that helped him to keep the clubs out of trouble. He worked for charitable causes like using the fetish clubs to raise toy money for Toys for Tots, and uh, for 25 years he was involved in the AIDS candlelight vigil in Greenwich Village. He was also a frequent commenter on the blog Jeremiah's Vanishing New York, and he also did some writing for the Huffington Post. Every night, he would keep a wary eye over the people in the club, making certain that the, uh, the inexperienced would not be taken advantage of, and steering the innocent clear in matters of SM etiquette. And uh, in this picture, here's Alan Selby and Lenny Waller in their full leather outfit at the Gay leather party at the Spike. That was at uh, 120 11th Avenue. And this is the card for the original Hellfire Club at 28 9th Avenue. And in this picture, you see a photograph of the original Under the Street Hellfire Club. This is an old brick vault under the streets of 9th Avenue. Those are incredibly thick brick arches that support the ceiling. And um, this was a photograph I took in 1983. The club was empty. There was absolutely no one there. I got there early. So I took advantage of it at the moment and took a photograph of the club. And you can see the curved arch ceiling. Now, what made the meatpacking disc was so interesting is it had a lot of uh, different fetish clubs. You had paddles up on uh, 21st Street, you had the Hellfire, you had the Lure, you had the uh, Mine Shaft, uh, the Anvil, the Locker Room, Jays, the Spike, um, Eagle's Nest. You had all these clubs within walking distance of one another. So that would create it sort of a critical mass in the meatpacking district for anyone who was interested in fetish play. And um, on 
some nights, organizations would take over the uh, club space and do an event, a party. Here you have Metro New York NLA. This was in 1992. And on the right, you have the Eulenspiegel Society. It's an educational group, and it is still active in New York City. And here, everyone is gathering, showing the flag, showing the banner, showing the leather at the Hellfire Club. And uh, on the left, you can see somebody with the siren's vest. Excelsior Motorcycle Club on the right. And this is taken in the Hellfire Club. And here's Lenny going out to greet the firemen who are coming there for a fire. And you can see the, on the wall, this was written, this was printed on the wall of the Triangle Building, the original Hellfire Club with the schedules Fridays and Saturdays. And on Sundays would be manhole from on certain nights. And uh, that's Lenny coming out to the fresh air from the, from the uh, Hellfire Club. And here he is at the coat check, taking care of people. People would come in. You hand over your clothes and walk around the club. And in this shot, you can see just how thick the brick arches were that supported the streets above. Uh, these buildings were constructed at a time when uh, brick was a relatively cheap an easy way to create very stable structures. But these are one of the uh, back rooms under the sidewalks of Hudson Street. And uh, you can see just how curved these are. And here's Lenny at Gay Pride March with Lois marching down the avenue. He was a marshal for that particular parade. And uh, when Giuliani became mayor, he began to attack all the uh, sex clubs, bookstores, anything sexual he attacked, claiming it was destroying New York. Um, and here's Lenny at Foley Square protesting against Giuliani's laws. Um, Lenny fought the sex club laws and he was victorious when he convinced the city to exempt anal penetration with a dildo from the law because the act does not transmit HIV. That was one of Lenny's accomplishments with city government. And here he is on 13th Street outside of the bar The Lure, which you can see on your left. There's Lenny posting a sign for Manhole Men's Club New York City. There he is with his famous white beard at Folsom Street East. This is 1999, and there's Lenny Waller. And now you will get to hear Lenny Waller himself. These have the new people. These are the new people. Those are the ones who are now running everything. But at one time we were the new people. And hi, Lenny. How hi. are you today? Good from How are you? Uh, you're, you're, you're Lenny Waller, who uh, a member of a leather SM community for many years. Yeah. And um, why don't you give us a little background about who you are? Okay, I'm Lenny Waller. Uh, my interest in fetish, SM, B and D. Probably goes back to my uh, junior high school days, when you could still buy those great paperback books on Forty Second Street for uh, ninety-five cents, a dollar and a quarter, two dollars, three dollars was a big book. Uh, and uh, those days, you really only had to be like eighteen to get in, so everybody had phony ID then. You used it in the bar, you used it to get into the X-rated movies, you used it to get into the bookstores, and I was lucky. I had a mustache and I looked older. So I didn't often get kicked out. And uh, it was funny because uh, a young lady, and I'll only use her first name, Sarah, her father's a well-known actor, was in uh, junior high three with me in the village, and 
she had experienced uh, interest in being dominant and being into S and M, and it was like, oh boy, this is my great chance. Well, after she got me tied up and I undressed and tied up, and I figured this was great. She came at me with a bullwhip, and then it was like, am I really into this shit? <laughs> uh, it, I had to rethink it quite a bit. Then, probably by the age of, oh, 15 or 16, I uh, found this magazine on the newsstand. It was a quarterly publication, Pleasure from Camden, New Jersey. And uh, I had found this couple advertising and uh, snuck money out of my savings account at the bank so my parents wouldn't know, replied to the ad, and they were pros and I met them. And it was okay, but really not what I was looking for. Being forced to go down on the guy didn't bother me because I was by. Uh, but it was just not the experience I was looking for. Uh, later on that year, I uh, took an ad from the Village Voice, which was, quote-unquote, the sex industry paper of the time, because mm -hmm. everyone advertised on the yeah. massage. And whether you wanted an English massage, a German massage, a Russian massage, it sort of told you what you were getting. Um, I remember um, years ago at a member meeting at uh, the National Leather Association. Yeah, in LA. And they had a meeting at the Novit Hotel. Yeah. Novit Hotel on um, Broadway. Right. And they had this woman from, I think she was in California. She was like very famous for being like, uh, what was her name, Nan? Nan Burroughs? Nan Burroughs, I think her name yeah. was. And she was, she was basically giving an explanation like they had to put their advertising in the various papers like uh, wanting to teach English or something right. like that. Yes. They had these, all these roundabout About ways. ways of doing it. You had to decode the ads. You had to decode the ads. Uh, matter of fact, uh, oh, I'm trying to think what the name of the organization was. Getting old, the memory goes. Uh, there was a gay organization, and I ho hope before the end of the interview I can think of their name. Madison? No, Mattachine was a, the Mattachine Society was for people coming out. This was a contact meeting organization. Hmm. And they did everything in letter and number codes. And after you joined, they sent you the copy of the codes. You almost felt like uh, somebody with a Dick Tracy decoder ring. You had to read the letter and the number and then look it up on the chart to see what the person was it's into. It's almost like a communist conspiracy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I can't think of the uh, name of it. I first met you, I believe, like you know, well, it was partly um, national. Um, what was it? Oil, uh, Oil and Spiegel. Oil and Spiegel. And uh, I remember the first time I went to a place called the Hellfire Club. Yes. Was for a meeting of the Oil and Spiegel Society. They had a meeting right. there one. We had some of their meetings in the early days. In the early eighties. Right. I we also like, held uh, meetings with. National Leather Association, uh, LSM, GMSMA, mm -hmm. uh, Jovian Gentlemen, Hot Ash, Foot Friends, a number of groups. I remember that first night, you know, it was like, okay, the meeting was over and somebody was having a wedding, and I think it was a guy named Wolf was having a wedding. The bride wore black leather. He had tattoos. and Right, Wolfie. People were walking around spanking and naked, and it was like, "Oh my God, this is incredible!" Yeah. When did when did Hellfire first open up? About what well, year? Well, actually, it was in the late seventies, but in the late seventies, it was gay. Before it was Hellfire, if I can regress a little past mm -hmm. that to history, across the street, four hundred West Fourteenth Street on the top floor was the toilet. Mm -hmm. It was a gay bar and they had a sw two swings over the bar and naked young studs swinging on the swings and uh, 
you know, people gathering at the bar, and it was six, and it was a tiny little space on the top floor of this building, and of course no liquor license, and every six months or so you'd get busted, of course they're doing business in New York, and when they finally got closed, they said, we opened up what was known as the sewer, which was way predecessor to Hellfire, which if you remember the early Hellfire, or the sewer, or the catacombs, was downstairs at 28 Ninth Avenue, underneath Jay's, and there were two in, there were two doors. There was a front door closer to 13th Street, and in the middle of the block, at those days there was still a shed on 9th Avenue. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of the shed there was another door, and the reason for that door is the other side of that wall was the back door of Jay's Hangout. But Jay's didn't officially have a back door. Years ago it was a German bar and that led out onto the street. It was all glass paneled. Subsequently the shed went up, the panels were covered in, and the roll-up door remained. And I have the picture at home and one day I'll show it to you. Was a uh, oil painting of a nude man which hung over this almost boarded up doorway. And it was apropos for a gay bar's back room at the time. But at four o'clock in the morning, they would turn the painting over. And there was an arrow on the back of the painting that said, open downstairs. And as door would open, you'd go down these rickety wooden stairs. And it was really the pit area of what was uh, Hellfire, Catacombs, the there Hellfire is. was originally under the street uh, itself. Right. But this was the back area where you may have remembered originally were mazes and then the mazes were torn down and there was a stage and an upper stage, a little sitting area and uh, later days it became a cement uh, glory hole wall on the left. This is after you walked in the entrance, went through the main room and went to the back which would be glory towards hole. the tip of 14th Street. And I remember, like, it was very strange because you have all these little rooms. Right. And sometimes there would be, like, a couple in the room, right. two people, just sitting there talking. And all these men... And would be gathering would be around. gathering around, climbing the walls to peek to in. Right. And the only thing that would stop people from coming into the little cubicle was a little, a little chain. chain across. Right. You we know? always did that. We said, if you wanted company, leave the chain down. If you didn't want company, put it up. And, and, and of course, you know, you get all the uh, wankers sitting there, standing there, I should say. And of course, they'd be pressed up against the chain. It's like, give them room to breathe. So, sometimes someone would go in the back and like, you know, take a belt and whack the wall and scream. Right, and, and people sure. would come running. Um, you know, people were drawn. You know, we want to see the leather freaks. And of course, in later years, it was outlined by the famous, the infamous, and the limos parked upstairs, coming downstairs to see the leather freaks. I remember Tiny Tim coming in. Yes, a number of times. Annie and Sprinkle would come by. Yes. I think Jersey Kaczynski was said to have come by there. And wrote a book, Pinball, based on uh, Hellfire. And uh, I remember some porn Spider stores. Web Spider and, Web. Uh, of course. We actually did a party with Spider Web. Uh, countless porn stars, uh, countless well-known dominas, and matter of fact, in you know, jumping around a little bit in later years in the early eighties, uh Chris uh worked at uh, Hellfire as a bouncer, as a doorman and at one point for briefly a manager, and he was married to Ann Pierce, the famous dominant from New Jersey, who eventually left the country. Uh so we had our conglomeration. It was a very big mix of anyone, everyone Every with a common stuff. interest. It wasn't, you know, this is straight, this is gay. But as I say, when it opened originally as the sewer, then the catacombs, and even Hellfire in its early onset was gay. And then, of course, we had the idea of let's mix it. Let's see if we get what happens if we put 
men and women together. Well, gay men were very happy. They played every hetero female that came down was in their glory because they were watching gay men play. Uh, some of the hetero men were very out of place. Uh, but all in all, there was really space for everyone. You know, it's like everyone defined their little areas, and it was like, it's fine to watch, it's not fine to touch without permission. The glory holes were in the back, and you could have glory, glory holes, holes were in the back. back. They were originally wood, and then what we did is we, in essence, uh, cemented over the wood. We wire lathed it and put a coating of cement. So we had the one of the first cement glory holes. Then um, I I remember one of the groups that would come by, which you could set your clock by, were the kids from Rocky Horror Rocky Horror Show. Three. Two, one, one and all the kids yes. would come in. And that was because Nina, who was the cashier at Rocky Hara, had a very big thing for young kids. And, you know, we always said, you know, we had a big sign up front, 21 and over, but, you know, 18 and over. If we knew you. If not, yeah over 21 uh, and she would come in with this Rocky Hara following and one of the most interesting things we ever had there is this young lady uh, full Rocky Hara garb came in and that was cool she was cute and she goes up to Candy who was like one of the grand matriarchs of Hellfire she'd sit there and take tickets and sell drink tickets and this little girl was shaking and came up to her and myself and Candy Slave Bill who was a big guy went up and go what happened? She goes I gotta tell you something and it was like what? Do you know you have sadists and masochists here? And it was like, yes, and, say, and Candy is holding this big cat of nine tails and a dildo handle going like this with it. What about the sadist and mass? Well, her boyfriend who dragged her in from Rocky Horror told her it was a cool place to be. Never told her what kind of place it was. <laughs> Needless to say, that was her first and last experience. Uh, but it was interesting. And Nina's thing was always she would take a sheet and go in back. And we had like a flat area next to the air conditioning unit. And all it was was two by fours with plywood sides and a plywood type top because there was piping under it and a piece of carpeting on top. Uh, and she'd lay out this white sheet or whatever color sheet she'd bring and spread herself out. And Nina was really a big girl. And it was the orgy. Fucking eat Nina. And she'd bring all these little kids following her. You know, by little kids, I mean 18, 19, 20. Uh, but it was novel. It was quite novel. And that was the Hellfire Club. Yes. Then I believe it shut down sometime in 86. The city no, got actually, into it. No, uh, actually, 85. Right, 85, 86. 85, it got shut down for a while. Well, actually, we didn't get shut down. We closed in 85 in the height of the AIDS crisis. Uh, the, the logic we used uh, was if you close yourself, you can reopen yourself. If the city closes you, you're going to be in court fighting to get reopened. It took several months. I mean, you had to like redo the whole area. Got rid well, of the no, that holes. was actually later on. Uh, redoing everything was after the Happy Land fire. That uh, Happy Land fire, that was... About 91. 91. That was in the Bronx. Yes. Uh, the Happy Land fire was a social club. Uh, in Tremont Avenue, Southern Boulevard. Right. And, I used to live there. Uh, it, it was frequented by the Spanish community, and this guy had a fight with his girlfriend and set the stairway on fire by pouring gasoline, and the exits were closed. And every, uh, everyone basically died inside. 
So the city came out the next day with guidelines on social clubs, uh, that they had to be up to code, had to be up to building code, had to be up to fire code. And these were not even really passed into law. The preview, pretext of the law, was still handwritten. And the city went around, again, closing every club around. By that time, Hellfire had changed its name to The Vault. Mm -hmm. And Frank, who was, you know, one of the owners of The Vault, uh, says, no, we're going to stay open that night. And I was around the corner at the Annex. What was that? That was uh, 675 Hudson Street. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fire department came around. That was very funny because I was having a pump party with Rick McShane. And fire, the, fire, the local firehouse was always good with all the clubs. You know, they said, look, we're waiting for the building inspectors. We're not here to bust your balls. And there was a young fireman says... Well, I'm going to go down and take a look. And the fire chief who just looked at him and says, why don't you wait till the building inspectors come? He goes, no, I'm going down. Well, he goes down and this big black guy comes up to him and goes, I just love a man in uniform. I never saw such a scared fireman come running out of the basement in my life. You had to see the fire chief just laughing at him. He says, I told you don't go down there. I well, don't. we closed. <laughs> and just as we really closed. I put, rolled the gate down. Everybody was out. I put the padlock on the door. Sure enough, the building department shows up. Goes, well, we're here to investigate. I go, you know, I wish I could help you. I only take care of the place. I locked it. I don't have the keys to get back in. They always leave it, the gate unlocked and the lock there for me. It's closed. You're going to have to wait till we can get the owners. So they go around the corner to the vault and Frank has still got it open saying, well, we have two exits. You can't bother us. Needless to say, the vault got shut down. They could bother you. Oh, yeah, they could bother you. But to our luck, the building inspector, instead of saying, these are your violations, and this is why we're closing you, originally for many, many, many years, building department would come in, department would come into a place, give you violations, and you'd have a copy of the list they gave you, and you'd work on them. And they'd come back, say, for an inspection two months later, and you corrected six out of 14 violations. And they'd say, okay, you got 90 days to correct the others. And they'd leave you alone, and you'd correct them. This guy, I can't remember his last name, but his first name was Charlie. Uh says, you will never open a place like this again. And it was like, what does the kind of place have to do with building code violations? And on the violations he wrote, this type of establishment should not ever be allowed to open again. Well, that was ammunition to fight it. Needless to say, we had to comply. And the attorney we used at the time was Gilbert Wallach, and he's long passed away. He did a lot of clubs in those days. Uh, started shaking his head, looking at the violations. Said, nope, you'll never open. I was like, Gil, you fought everything else. He goes, no, I'm the city now. And I had gone to somebody I used to work for. And I says, listen, do you know a lawyer that could do this? He goes, there's only one lawyer I know of that might be able is Stanley Schlein of Freed Abbott, Whitnam Ransom, and Morgan. Uh, and we went to him. And he goes, yes, I can probably get it open. One of his associates, Charles Foy, was the attorney, was actually the head attorney for the uh, Department of State that wrote the laws that closed all the sex clubs in 85. So if anyone could find a loophole in the law, it was Charles Foy, because they told him, you write laws that'll close all these sex clubs. So we retained Stanley. I don't want to say how much money was spent fighting this. 
and I felt like the biggest liar around because for many months you call up our recording uh, we're closed right now working on the violations we'll be open in three months mm -hmm. join us for our gay pride party Join us for our Columbus Day party. Wasn't wasn't there a place on 21st or 22nd, just off 6? Yes, that was uh, before. In 85, when we closed uh, Hellfire, we opened up King's Pleasure. King's Pleasure on what, 23rd? 54 West 22nd on the 4th floor. Yeah, I remember having to go all the way up to that one. Yeah, and that was uh, a novel experience. The building actually was mixed use, meaning it was not only residential, it was commercial. And uh, as I say, the lawyer we used to use, Gil Wallach, wrote the perfect lease. I mean, once we opened, the lady on the top floor treated us, he called every city agency, and the landlord said, well, you're violating your lease. And we took the lease out, we went to court, and the judge goes, well, when are they open? Well, they're open from around 9, 10 o'clock at night till 4, 5 in the morning. And the judge looked at the landlord, he says, that's what the lease says. The landlord looks at the lease and says, Your Honor, it says they're open from 9 to 5. And the judge says, they didn't specify AM or PM, and you never made them. Their lease is valid. <laughs> okay, let's okay. stop for a second while we relax. And we'll continue. Starting here. Okay. Once again, we're speaking to Lenny Waller, who used to work at the old Hellfire Club, who put together Mother's March Against AIDS. Well, actually, I didn't put together Mother's March Against AIDS. Mother's March Against AIDS was originally... A united uh, group uh, comprised of chapters of many states, and Bev Rotter uh, put the New York group of Mothers March Against AIDS together. Uh, her daughter was HIV, and uh, there were no groups that were really out there to help. Uh, females with HIV uh, and drug addiction and uh, Bev uh, went from Congress to the city officials and started it and she wanted to put a face on AIDS. In uh, 1985 though the leather straight by fetish communities uh, myself, the members of GMSMA, LSM, uh, Wally Wallace from the Mine Shaft. Uh, the last Friday before AIDS, did a candlelight vigil commemorating all those who were lost to AIDS and those living and affected by AIDS. Uh, and that went on for about two years and then uh, Bev Rotter came to us and said I want to include uh, you know my daughter and the groups that have helped her and on account of Bev's interaction they opened the Iris House in Harlem for uh, HIV and drug related issues so that became the conglomerate and for many years up until about 2001 uh, we always went under the banner of Mother's March Against AIDS and in 2001 Bev Rotter decided that that was it. Uh, you know she had enough I mean when we started this, you had 30, 40 people working on putting the march and presentation together every year. Uh, by the time Bev wanted to give it up in 2001, 
Uh, and I was really very annoyed because she announced on stage without consulting anyone that this was the last uh, AIDS vigil. I was the speaker after her and said, no, it's not. We will be here till they find a cure. Mm -hmm. uh, so I took it over and the name changed to uh, AIDS Candlelight Vigil New York City and we have continued every year since traditionally the Friday before Gay Pride in June. Uh, and the problem is AIDS is a common household word today. There isn't the anger, there isn't the, uh, death, you don't have the death rate. outcry, you don't have the death rate, you don't have the scarring, a lot of the visual that you had. People live a lot longer. But the cocktail is not the cure. No. People are I, dying. The rate is going up. The rates in different the rate communities, of the rates of infection in different communities change, and uh, you're getting a newer, younger generation being affected because they've heard about it, they've read about it, they know about it, they're educated in school about it, but they haven't buried a friend and a lover. They haven't been affected by it. They haven't seen like the tremendous they death rate, right? right. right. That and they haven't the 80s. lost their buddies, their friends, their lovers, and that makes a very big difference. We lost Keith Haring. We lost uh, Maplethorpe. Uh, we lost uh, a host of people. a host of them. You know, countless leather community leaders. Uh, it was just terrible. Uh, and uh, you have to keep it present. And, you know, in the early days of the vigil, Christopher Street would be filled with people. It would be probably a thousand people or better. Now, now we get a hundred if we're lucky. But uh, these are the hundred that co come out every year because they care, they know, and they realize we have to continue putting a face on AIDS, putting the putting it in retrospect of today's society and saying we will be here mourning those we lost, caring for those we love that are affected until there is a cure and there has to be a cure. And that's basically what it is. AIDS Candlelight Vigil is not city, state, or federally funded. It's put together by individuals of the community who care and this year uh, 2010 I honestly looked up and said to a lot of people I need help we are down to a committee of two myself and my lover Gail and you know people have tried people have other things they get busy in their life with other things and this becomes less important to them to me, it is still of paramount importance. So you continue doing it. Ephraim has been an angel and photographed many, many, many of our events, marches, and helped us catalog it historically on film. And that is so important. The Reverend Bumgardner from MCC Church, Father Smith from St. Veronica's, you know, we're all dedicated and we want to see an end to it. And we will be here until there's an end. This, you know, this happens um, on the Friday before. Before Gay Pride. Before Gay Pride. And then, uh, then of course, for, you, for many years for Gay Pride, you were always there. Yes, this right. actually was the second year I was not there for Gay Pride. 2008, I had open heart surgery. In June, there was no way. Mm. And this year I was sick again. I had stents done, and I technically shouldn't have done the vigil, but, uh, you know, self-motivation uh, said do it. And ironically, we had to wait in front of St. Veronica's for the parishioners to come out and join us. And I turned to Huey Bruce, who was there, uh from the gay veterans, and I said, you know, thank God we stopped in front of St. Veronica's because we had to continue the other mm. block and a half to the river, they could have thrown me in with the wreath. I never would have made it. 
This year they shortened all parades in New York City. And However, I'm, not the candlelight vigil. Not the candlelight. Well, that's yeah. Well, that's that's pretty short as it is. It is, and we were told, you know, you've done this. This was our 25th year, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not looking at you as a parade. They're looking at it as a neighborhood vigil. Until they get specific orders on us, they're leaving us alone. Well, yeah. And we've had good relations uh, with the police department over the years. Uh, from Inspector Campisi, who is now a three-star chief, uh, to Tim Duffy in Community Affairs, the new guys in uh, Officer O'Halloran in Community Affairs now in the 6th, Ed Singer, who just retired last year in the 6th, and it, it's always been one hand washes the other, and they've always been very cooperative and helpful, i got to say that. This year they made the uh, Gay Pride March shorter, which for me, I, I, you know, I was a little disappointed, but then again I realized it means I have to walk less. Yes. And uh, getting older, all of a sudden losing 20 blocks is sort of a blessing in disguise. Yeah. This is something I found in a trash bin. I was dumpster diving and I found... From Stonewall! The Stonewall from 1970. 1970. And all of these pictures, of course, are legit and I know they're on your website too. And it's so funny because like, that's where I saw them and you downloaded them. You could photograph from. all the people in, with one camera. Right. You can get the entire group in one one shot. Well, uh, again, what a lot of people fail to realize is they see it starting on Fifth Avenue now. Before that, it started in the village and uh, you had up. on Central Park West, and then went down Central Park South, and then down Fifth Avenue. Mm. Before that, it started in the village and went up to Central Park and dispersed into Central Park. Mm. And of course, in the early days, we weren't just marching up Sixth Avenue; we were running because people were throwing boxes, bottles, and rocks and paving stones and things at us. We weren't the most popular kids in town, to say the least. Yeah, but it had to be done, and it was done. And here's a great picture from Central Park of after the uh, parade. Because the parade would disperse into Central Park. It was their way of getting rid of us. You went up 6th, and there was uh, a police inspector, actually uh, Inspector Pine, uh, who was in charge of uh, Lower Manhattan, uh, public morals and vice, and he was the inspector that orchestrated the raid on the Stonewall, which helped form the birth of gay rights. Ironically, he passed away this year. Uh, and there was a police uh, captain, Captain O'Rourke, who always said, you faggots will never go in front of St. Patrick's. The year we won the right to lay the wreath in front of St. Patrick's is the year he retired. So that became a big thing. I have here some old photographs in the mid 80s of the uh, streets of the meat market. Yeah, and Hellfire was here and you can still see the shed. Well, here you can see the uh, the V. The V when it became the vault. When it became the vault. Right, and the shed was here. Now this was the door and the stairs went down this way. Over here in the darkening area was let me see if I can find it. Uh, it's somewhere right about here, over this little rise, uh, was a door that really opened into the woodwork, was our back door that led out. But the other side of that door was Jay's. Mm -hmm. So they would come out of Jay's and go right down those stairs for the after hours parties. They were like there was supposed to be like a sub basement below the basement someone had said it said or not room. with us the building that had the three sub basements was the mine shaft the mine shaft that was located where 635 washington street 
And uh, then on 13th Street, you had the Lure. Right. And many that, years later, which many, was uh, the uh, hard work and diligent work of Walter Wally Wallace and 13 Partners. I remember in the basement, they used to have... Um, it was basically the meat packing district. And right. one of the fun things about the Lure, if you go in the basement, they had these walk-in ovens right. that they would uh, use... For smoking meats at one time. For smoking meats at one or time. Or smoking people or... And they use, them, they use them for photo shoots yeah. at the time. They use them for photo shoots. Uh, just a different kind of meat in the basement. And then, I believe, the Hellfire late 80s moved to 13th and 10th Avenue into an old freezer no, building. No, actually that was 93. 93. Yes. 93, they opened up the 93, vault. 93, no, no. No, the Hellfire. No, 93, no, no, no. the vault at 28 9th Avenue closed. Mm-hmm. And moved down the block to 28 10th Avenue, which was formerly Mars. Mm -hmm. uh, Frank and Janet at that time, and I was working with them, had the great idea that there were five floors, so you're going to make five times as much money. <laughs> And they didn't want to hear that you would have five times as much headaches. And of course they got involved with all the wrong people. Leave it at that. And one thing I insisted on with them when we did this is each floor should have a separate lease and each floor should be a different corporation. Well, after they got mixed up with the outside money, well, you know, we can save so much money by not having separate corporations, by not having separate leases. And, of course, they got rid of me. Uh, and that was fine. I really didn't have any great uh, love for them. They owed me quite a bit of money, which a lot of it I've never seen. Uh, and I had spoke to uh, Big John, who had re wanted to reopen uh, Hellfire under Jays. And at that time, uh, he was going to open a bookstore at 673, 675 Hudson called Red Door Book. And he got Dave Nesser, who was going to get videos for him and open the bookstore. In... 94, they were opening uh, Hellfire at the original location, 28 9th Avenue. And I needed to keep a low profile, so I went over there and just said, well, okay, uh, Dave can run around and tell everyone he's the manager, and that's fine. I'm just going to sit here and make sure it works right. Nona was the bartender back then. Mm -hmm. Uh, Marie was there and her quote-unquote sister, Lisa, they hired. Uh, Bruce? Bruce came later. Uh, then I hired, after a while, uh, Christy was our bartender for a while. She was a good bartender. I know Christy since she was a kid. Uh, she used to work... Uh, and bar at the zoo after hours, and that's going back quite a few years. Uh, and after Christy, I had Angel, and then I needed another bartender, and I hired Karen. Mm. And through Karen, Barbara came. Mistress Barbara, I should say, before I, somebody gets mad at me. <laughs> uh, and then Christy decided to leave, and Barbara and Karen were my house great house dominance, uh, great bartenders, great friends, great people, and we're still friendly today. It was, it was the whole area was just a wonderful old neighborhood. Well, that's it, what it was. It was the meatpacking district, but the, mostly they loaded the stuff at night. You didn't see them in the day. Right, Or and the other thing is, we were open at night. Now, uh, across where uh, I guess it's the New Body arch Archives above the garage mm -hmm. is. That used to be Brothers Trucking years and years ago. And they'd have all their trucks lined up 
double, triple parked on Ninth Avenue. Guys would be fucking around in the back of the trucks. They'd come over to the club. They'd come in. You'd have all the uh, transvi- transvestite hookers working Ninth mm-hmm. Avenue. The cops yes. would come. They'd come running over. We'd have to chase them out. Uh, but, you know, there still was a sense of community. Everyone knew everyone. You know, you'd close up in the morning. You'd be coming upstairs. The hookers are still out there turning tricks, looking for the last job. But everyone said good morning. There was it was sort of a critical mass of Massive clubs. clubs. You had Jays, you had Hellfire, Lures, Paddles was on Twenty First. Right, yeah. Also had the Mine Shaft in those early Washington days. Washington Street, Mothers, Mothers, Mothers in Washington. And then 14th. you know earlier than that, uh, you had the Anvil right on Tenth. Yes, the Anvil under the hotel. Uh, you had uh, the Strap. You had guys wandering over from. Uh, Eagle? The Spike and the Eagle. And the, where were they were located? Uh, Spike was on 20th and 11th. The Eagle was 21st and 11th. Mm-hmm. Uh, on 10th years before that, you had the Glory, uh, a bar called the Glory Hole. Of course, coming up from Christopher, you had uh, Badlands on the corner of Christopher. Badlands, right on the corner. Right, you had the old Ramrod in the middle of the block. Sneakers, sneakers, which was a tiny little wooden building, right? And, and that was right between West Street and Weehawken. It was right, a tiny little street straight, right? Weehawken. And you had, of course, the shop, the Leather Underground, run by JoJo Hughes. I remember once walking along the West Side Highway, the elevated highway, right? And you would look down on a Sunday afternoon at the Badlands, which right, was on the corner of Christopher, Christopher and right. Washington, and you see like an ocean of leather jackets, right? Because every daddy would always have his boy out on a Sunday afternoon, up and down West Street, up and down Christopher Street. You could see them on the corner of West and Christopher, right. like a big, big a mass of leather, right? Black and brown leather, right? And down the block, if you went south of Christopher Street, uh, you went Keller's, which was one of the original leather bars in the city. Downstairs, in the bottom of the Hotel Keller. Before, yeah, at that time in the 80s and 90s, uh, West Street was mostly like industrial, was like garages, right. truck depots, truck right. depots, porno theaters were right. They still were too, right. And uh, south of Christopher, you had a lot of trucks parked, right. And also uh, north of Christopher, uh, on 11th Street, right off West Street, there was a tiny little bar. Uh, this cell block. They'd come out and uh, as you went further up, way before Mars, uh, as you went up, the building that was Mars housed uh, Alex in Wonderland and the Asterix. These are places I, I you know, did, these places just came and went. A lot right. Of, and, you know, if of you course blinked, you had, they were gone. gone. Right. You had the ramp and the thing is, all these people at four or five o'clock in the morning mm-hmm. were hungry, and there were really very few places to go at that time in the morning. If you went down to Christopher by Washington, you had the Silver Dollar, and if you went uh, north on Fourteenth and Ninth, you had the Country Kitchen. So these two. Was that on the northwest corner? That was on the northwest corner. Also called Nick's at one time. Nick's Country Kitchen. Country Kitchen, and the food there was so bad. Right, and you. But know, then again, five o'clock in the, in the morning, morning, you didn't care, and you'd have uh, Ron, who was one of our bartenders, who was hilarious. Would always come out with these, come up in these brown chaps, and his cock would be hanging out. They'd be playing frisbees with the pancakes. I remember walking along one weekend afternoon down Bleecker Street. Right. It was like 5 to 6 a.m. It was just beginning to break daylight. Right. And there were these two leather daddies in a little park on Bleecker Street right. jerking each other off in the park. They were kissing and jerking off. And I was like the only witness. Right. Everyone else was like dead asleep. But there right. they are. The twilight's coming up and they're, they're going at it. And yeah. I remember, you know, you Walking down Washington Street at night in the 80s, I was like, so scary. Sp- scary and spooky. And the other one we have to get in here is the old 220 Club, 220 West Houston upstairs. 
was an after hours club mm -hmm. uh, which for many years was notorious and I think the irony is in later years 220 West Houston Street upstairs became an AA meeting so many of the people who went there to get high are now there to get straight okay let's stop, stop. for a minute okay we're gonna stop everyone in those days used to know Big Black Billy who worked on uh, 42nd Street and he'd worked the door there and the rest of the time it was a uh, swing club and people would always call up and say well what's the uh, difference and they had these two very, very nice lesbian bartenders Queenie and Joe great people and they go well if you whip it out on the wrong person it will get whipped off <laughs> and it was a fantastic place. Uh, Judy and Lois, of course, had Clubbo at Fantasy Manor. Uh, Magdasad had Magdasad's studio on uh, further down on 19th Street. Uh, there were so many. Bella De Jour in her studio did uh, vignette one day a week and a dungeon tour, and you'd, they'd get volunteers to come up from the audience, and one of the most horrific scenes she ever did, she had a slave, Donald, who many of the old-timers may remember, and he was into piercing. And the foreskin on his cock on the sides, there are really not that many nerve endings. Uh, she would take his cock and nail it with a six-inch spike to a breadboard. And you could see every guy in the audience grab their crotch. And she always go, are there any volunteers? And nobody moved. I remember seeing some uh, cock nailing scenes at the uh, old Hellfire. Yeah, Island. sure. Uh, which was common, and piercings were common. Uh, Had some art shows down there. Art shows, sure. Ira Smith won. Uh, actually, Ira Smith came to me when we just became the vault with his portfolio and says, you think anyone would be interested in this art? I go, it is good. Uh, it was cleaner and more modern, say, than Rex. Not as muscle-bound as the Hun. Uh, it was really talented artwork. He did a couple of flyers for us. And I remember I talked him into taking some of his work and donating it to Leather Pride and get get it auctioned off to get his name out there. And the first couple of years, his work would go up and nobody would bid on it. So I bid on it. I mean, you, well, what could be more insulting to an artist than submitting something, donating it, and not having somebody bid on it? So over the years, Ira and I became fast, good friends. Mm -hmm. Uh, now he's a very well-known and respected gay artist, and now he's also branching into some hetero work and female forms. Yeah, you got to pay the bills. Yeah, and his work is amazing because it's all number two pencil. Uh, Rex, of course, uh, his leather icons, uh, unbelievable work. I have some of his early publications, some mm -hmm. of his early works. Classic. And, you know, people don't appreciate that today. Uh, you know, a lot of gay men, gay couples, lesbian couples would not put something like that up in their house today. Uh, but it's a treasure and a reflection of the time, and it has to be accepted for what it was, pure art of the time. Um, we started this back in the late 70s. We basically came right. of age in the late 70s. Right. In the 80s, we had our Hellfire Vault patterns. Right. That. In the 90s, we had them as well. Then towards the end of the 90s, um, the meat market began to change and we began to lose all the venues. Absolutely. Uh, basically, I like to say that uh, the meat market was like an abandoned garden. And right. we grew in it. Right. And, and the thing is, the surrounding area was accepting. You had Christopher Street, you had the gay bars, and they were housing of it. You have to realize that straight slash hetero 
S and M evolved from the leather gay leather community. Uh, whereas in England and Germany, they had a very set hetero S and M community. In the United States, we evolved from Out of the, the gay. gay community, and we picked up a lot of the traits: keys on the right or left. The hanky code. Mm -hmm. And we adapted it to our usage. You know, in the early days of Oil and Spiegel, when you'd identify top and bottom by, the, by which hand they wore their wristband on, you'd see people get out of their cars, open up the trunk, take out the wristband, look up and down the block and quickly snap it on, run into Oil and Spiegel. Because it wasn't an accepted norm as yet. We were on the fringe. I remember driving a taxi cab in the... Um in the mid 70s, right. 75, and sometimes I would get a leather daddy, right. and he'd want me to drive him to the bar because you know you don't want to be walking down these dark, dingy streets, the right. scary streets, to a, a leather bar all dressed up in leather. No, you want to get there in a cab, so you you, you know you get there protected. Right, absolutely. There was, and I it think was very one scary. Of the other things that I did, oh, probably towards the uh, late 80s. I wanted to do a charity uh, drive, toys for tots, for Christmas time for children with AIDS specifically. So I contacted uh, Gay Men's Health Crisis. I said, I want to do a toys for tots and I also want to do a fundraiser. And ironically, here is an organization to help gay men uh, to help them with HIV. Well, Toys for Tots, maybe. You want to do a fundraiser for us? We can't have our name associated with you. It's like, when did I come to Pariah? I'm a member of this community. I'm trying to give you money. Would not take my money. Would not let us do a fundraiser in their name. Uh, the AIDS Center in New York let us do a fundraiser. The following year, I did a Toys for Tots drive uh, with GMSMA, Hot Ash, the Renegades, and of course, Hellfire, and the Manhole. And we had a big jail cell there, and you'll see it on some of the old photographs. It was filled every inch of it, with toys, toys all around. This was in the Hellfire. Right. I remember the little jail cell in the, in the, in the, to, in the uh, towards the south wall. Right, that's no, where no, the west wall, right. the west wall. Filled with toys. Toys on the outside, toys still like on the Like a little stage. stage. Right. And there was a little bar for like a, a lap dancing. Right. And you could... Pole dancing, yeah. Full of toys. And I called them, I says, now, okay, you want to come and get these toys? <laughs> no. You could bring them to us, but we're not going to an S&M club. We don't want to be affiliated. So, at that time, I had an 85 Dodge van. We had 50 50-gallon 50 garbage bags full stuffed animals and toys. And in the Renegades newsletter, and I think I credit Darren and Charlie for this, there's a picture of leather daddies and leather men coming in, carrying bears, fire trucks, dolls under their arm. And they go, the caption read, what's wrong with this picture? Because you have these very sinister, stern-looking men in full black leather carrying toys. Because they really cared. And I had one guy, Alex, I never forget. He used to come to all our parties, was very heavy into being uh, disciplined with a razor strap, but he always had to get out to make the bus because his economics was such that he could only afford bus fare once a week down to us and back home. And Toys for Tots, he shows up with these two big gift wrap pink elephants from FAO Schwartz. He says, for children, I saved all year, all my money to get this for them. And that showed the dedication of the community. Mm -hmm. You don't see that today, unfortunately, and it's sad. Well, we had the community 
in the eighties and nineties. Right. But then you tried opening a, after after two after in the two thousands you tried opening a uh, club in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, and, that and didn't, I didn't. I tell you, I did it because people who were backing it wanted it done, and I looked at them. I said, "I'm sorry, nobody will come here." I mean, it was easily accessible by subway. It was accessible by subway. It was parking. It was on 39th Street between 3rd uh, Avenue, Avenue, Avenue and the Avenue. Dead End. Yeah. That's the only way to describe it. Because the Dead End was the pier. And there was this uh, boat slips and they loaded sand and cement. And I was, had and huge were, space, 5,000 square feet. And there were 24-hour stores in the neighborhood. Right, and 3rd Avenue up and down and you could park. Brooklyn was a dirty word in a foreign country. After two years of struggling, it was like, no, can't do this. Okay. All right, we're going to have to stop. Okay. My battery's running low. But um, perhaps we can do again and do some more. I'm I'd like to. I'm I'd like to bring some pictures and show you. Yes. So let us quit for now, and we will do this in a couple more weeks. Okay. Lenny, I want to thank you thank for all you, the information Ephraim. that you've given me. And thank you for and, the opportunity. Um, okay. Thank you. In March... Of 2011, Lenny Waller died of a heart attack. He passed away, and the next day the leather community was doubly shocked when his live-in girlfriend, Gail Kamidi, also died within 24 hours of Lenny's passing. We held a memorial for Lenny Waller and Gail at Paddles on 26th Street, and the loss was felt throughout the community. With his passing came an end of an old era, the era of the old meatpacking days and nights. And I'm most fortunate to have made this video at his insistence. He wanted to come to my house and have a video made of him talking about the history of the culture. I think that uh, with his heart condition, he probably felt he didn't have very long and as a local neighborhood historian, Lenny Waller was always answering questions, always giving out facts and figures, numbers, days, names, places. So in this video, I think he covered a lot of that. I think he wanted someone to record all the history that he knew that was so vital to the communities that were alive and active in those days and for all the future generations that will come this way. In future videos, I hope to be able to talk more about Lenny Waller and his life in the leather community. And I want to thank you for your time and coming to my lecture. Um, there will be others in the future. I hope you had a good time with this. I hope you enjoyed listening to Lenny Waller. My name is Ephraim Gonzalez. And thank you for coming to the Gonzo Archive.